Welcome, folks, to another Game Hoarder production. Gonna be starting a new series, a game book let's play through, let's read through series where we read through old game books of yore and uh, we get through them together, but of course uh, we do so successfully. So this thing that I started a while back was I used to play through my game books and then I would also go through and map basically how to how to get through the game books and I'll I'll show you a couple uh, a couple of these maps that I've created but they're basically maps that show you how to get through the game book uh, without dying uh, the correct path to take that doesn't end you up in death uh, so I figured hey what the hell it'd be kind of fun to read through these I'm pretty sure no one's ever done anything like this <clears throat> um, the only thing is, is that I haven't quite figured out how to uh, include uh, the death scenes, which are pretty funny in a lot of these books. Uh, obviously, we'll be starting out with a What Do I Do Now book, number one from the Zork series. There's a se there is only four of these in the series. I have all four, and I managed to find a PDF online that has the pictures. That when I first decided to do this, uh, I was just going to read it. And uh, there's really no way to scan these pages in myself because the books are super brittle. Uh, this particular one was, let's see, written in. I have the book here in front of me as well. Uh, 1983. So, the Game Hoarder was like five years old when this book came out. Um, and many of you weren't born probably. Many of you maybe grew up on these books, which is why I thought this would be kind of fun. Now, obviously, I'm going to be doing girl voices and grandma voices and little boy voices, whatever is is needed. It's going to be along the lines of the uh, Let's Read the Walking Dead comic series that I'm doing. Uh, so, obviously, uh, with my voice and my inflection, I only have so much range. Uh, but that's not really what this is about. This is more of about a new series that I'd like to introduce to you guys. See if it's something you, you would like to see me continue doing. And if not, be honest. If so, you know, leave a good comment, thumbs up, you know. And maybe this is something that we can uh, do once in a while. Uh, obviously, it takes time to map these books out. Uh, so what I'm going to do for this book is we were going to go through it. There's multiple directions and multiple uh, ways to get to the ending in this particular uh, game book. Um, so we'll just go through one way. And then I figured at the end uh, I would do a, a follow-up video with basically uh, the deaths and basically the page before. Uh, you take a wrong turn, read that page, and then it ends up in this death. The Zork... This Zork book uh, actually has a scoring system. It's uh, kind of like the game. The humor's eh, kind of like the game. Not as humorous, I would say, but some of it's there. So anyways, without further ado, let's get started with Zork, the Forces of Krill. Oh. Okay, so another thing I wanted to mention is this, as this is the first uh, Let's Read game book series, uh, there's going to be some errors like uh, what just happened. Uh, what I have to do is actually have to move the bandy cam window around to the, each of the pages. Uh, there's no way to flip through it. Um, so I'll be pausing between each page, moving the window to the next page, or moving the, the, the window itself behind the bandy cam frame uh, so that you can only see one page at a time. I could set it up to where I didn't have to move all the shit around, but then you would see... Uh, multiple pages. Uh, I'll try to show the artwork as well. Again, I'll have to move it under the frame of the bandy cam and uh, we'll just give it a wing this way. It's not a super long book, so we should be okay. Welcome to the kingdom of Zork. You are bored. There's nothing on TV except stupid reruns. You wander into your local bookstore and pick up an interesting looking book entitled Zork, The Forces of Krill. As usual, you turn to the first page and begin reading. The book is set in the magical land of Zork, where the evil, powerful warlock Krill is about to conquer the kingdom, and only you can save the day. There are trolls, gnomes, lizard warriors, sorcerers, and a giant empire to explore. It looks like a good book. Do you choose to save the kingdom? If so, purchase the book and turn to page five. Or 
do you choose to go home and watch reruns? So in this case, we'll quickly show you what happens if you don't purchase the book and go to page five. In front of the TV, your eyelids slowly close. A strange sound fills the room. Suddenly, your eyes open. Yor realize that you have been snoring. Think we have a typo. You can't get that Zork book out of your mind, but the bookstore is already closed. Think again. Wouldn't it be wise to purchase the book now and turn to page seven? Which is kind of funny because originally you turned to page five. Um, so anyways... Uh, the Cavern Doom, yeah, that's that's coming up. Ah, I have to be sure to click off the window or Microsoft Edge automatically resizes. Here's the intro page, Zork. Forces of Krill from Eric Moretzky. Tour Publishing, been around for a long time. Here we have some artwork, it's a sword of some type. What does it do, what does it mean? Let's find out. We have some more intro art here. This is page six. Page five was actually the sword. Um, <clears throat> we have three ornaments of some type or holy hand grenades. Again, we're not sure. The adventure starts on page seven. So let's do it. There is uh, also worth mentioning this book is pretty linear. Uh, it's one of the easier game books to complete, so you will notice that a lot of the pages just have you flipping to the next page to continue the dialogue. Uh, that happens a lot throughout the book. However, like any choose-your-own-adventure book or uh, Lone Wolf or whatever, uh, there is, of course, deviation. It was a warm, sunny day in early May. June and Bill were going home from school. We're going home. We're coming home from school. I don't know. I'm not, you know, I didn't graduate with an English degree or anything. But anyways, they were wondering how to spend the afternoon. Should they bicycle to Lookout Pass in the hills outside the town or explore the deserted fort on the riverbank? They didn't really want to do either. They realized the old games, old explorations, they simply weren't fun or exciting anymore. Bill and June discussed this feeling as they passed the unused water station beyond the schoolyard, its high brick walls hidden by a jumble of wild bushes. Suddenly, June stopped walking. What is it? Bill asked. I thought I saw something glowing there under the bush. June pointed at one particularly thick and twisted bush. Bill was skeptical, but he followed June to the bush and helped her pull the branches aside. They both saw it at the same time. It's, it's a sword, gasped June. An ancient sword of elven workmanship, added Bill. Like the one in the story we read in class today. He reached for the sword. Turn to page eight. Wait, June cried. It's a magical sword. It could be dangerous. Do you think Bill should take the sword? Go to page nine. Or do you think Bill and June should ignore the sword and continue home? Well, we're going to go ahead and take the sword because we're here for adventure. And also, if you go home, the adventure ends and you have zero points. Phil laughs. laughs. Don't be a ninny, June. I won't cut myself. He reaches deep into the heart of the bush and grasps the haft of the sword. As he touches the sword, it begins to vibrate wildly. There's a sound like a distant explosion. Immediately, a blinding light flashes from the blade and surrounds June and Bill. When the light fades and the two startled friends can see again, they realize that they are no longer near the school. They are on a winding path leading down from rocky foothills to a lush forest in the valley below. Behind them, impassable mountains rise, their tallest peaks lost in the clouds above. Their clothes have changed also. They are now wearing heavy cloth tunics, tied about the waist with wide leather belts. A large leather pouch hangs from Bill's belt. Bill and June stare at each other with mixed excitement and fear. Suddenly, a group of knights on horseback come galloping around a bend in the trail, heading toward the forest. The leader of the knights, his steed whiter and more powerful than the others, pulls away and approaches. Turn to page 11. There's a little uh, artwork to show you. Bill and June and the magical sword that they have come across. Elven magic, nonetheless. Bivoltar, Juranda! We feared you were lost to that demon Krill. Ah, you have the sword! The knight pauses, thinking. 
Sorry about that. I uh, just realized that my bandy cam was showing unregistered, so I had to re-enter my CD key or whatever. My, uh, my key. Pivotar, Gironda, we feared you were lost to the demon Krill. Ah, you have the sword. The knight pauses, thinking, I don't have time to stop. Your uncle Sayovar is meeting us at the campsite. Meet us there and bring the sword. You want to know what's happened since you've disappeared. You might seek the old man in the village. The tall knight points up to the path towards the foothills, then gives a farewell salute and gallops off after the others. Should we follow the knights to the campsite or find the old man in the village instead? Well, we can do either or. Let's go ahead and... Let's go ahead and find the old man. Let's talk to the old man in the village. Why not? Toting the dimly glowing sword, Bill heads up the trail toward the foothills. Come on, Gironda, he calls back. Soon the two brave adventurers are surrounded by bleak, rolling hills. The few trees that grow here are gnarled and crooked, and clouds cover the sun like a permanent gray stain upon the sky. Gironda shivers and moves closer to Bivotal. Around a bend in the road, they spot a few huts nestled between the barren hills. As they approach the village, a bearded man emerges from the closest hut. You escaped! He cries. He is very old. His long beard is as white as the tall knight's horse, and his face is deeply lined and wrinkled. Come in! You must be hungry! He says, entering the hut. The pair follows, their eyes fully adjusting to the dim interior. As the old man ladles three bowls of stew from a cauldron simmering in the fireplace, he asks, Have you heard any news since your escape? Things are looking very grim. Geronda glances at Bivotar and speaks. Um, actually, we haven't heard any news at all. Can, uh, you fill us in? Turn to page 19. Here is, uh, some artwork of Bivotar and Geronda, who have obviously had their names changed when they entered into the fantasy world. And the old man. Dishing out some soup soup. The ancient villager's eyes glaze over as if recalling some dim memory. Of course, you know that your uncle Sayovar was unable to prevent the fall of the great underground empire. The empire under the rule of the Flatheads controlled every neighboring land and was the most splendid kingdom in the history of man. But the Flatheads had become decadent and the forces of Krill had grown so strong that not even a great warrior wizard like Sayovar could stop them. Since you were captured by Krill's servants, over 200 years have passed here in the land of Frobars and in the kingdom of Zork, but Sayovar has been unable to overcome the evil that has taken the land. To gain victory, he must have the sword of Zork, which I see you have rescued. He will also need the Palantirs, the three crystal spheres of legendary power. But every day and every year the forces of Krill grow more daring. No village is safe from their attacks or their spells. The crops no longer grow and the wind is always cold and sour. Our own village, as you can see, is... Turn to page 20. Our own village, as you can see, is deserted now. The men have joined the Knights of Frobars and the women and children are hidden away in the mountains. He sighs deeply, then straightens up and stares at them with piercing eyes. You! Gironda and Bivotar must bring the Sword of Zork to your uncle in the forest. The journey will be filled with a hundred terrors and dangers. Remember to avoid the Trail of Leaves. It leads straight to Krill. And now we'll go to page 21, because that's our only choice. Of course, he adds, you could stay here safely with me and hope that the forces of Krill will somehow be driven out of the land. Will you stay with the old man? Go to page 23, and your adventure will end with a single point. Or we can go to page 14 and continue the adventure. I think it's kind of obvious at this point. Well, Bivita? Geronda giggles as they walk toward the forest. I guess it's turning out to be an exciting day after all. I hope we're not getting into trouble, Geronda. Soon the forest surrounds them, but there is no sign of the knights or the campsite they mention. The trees close in overhead, blocking out the light. The forest is damp and quiet except for the chirping of the distant songbird. 
The trail narrows, winding so often that Bivotar and Geronda lose all sense of direction. I think I smell a campfire. Bivotar pulls Geronda down the trail. They break out into a deserted clearing where a dying fire sends a thin finger of smoke up through the treetops. There's no one here, says Bivotar. Look there. Geronda points across the clearing. There the trail splits as the leaves in the clearing. The signpost stands at the fork, and nailed to the signpost is a handwritten note. The note reads, Bivitar, Geronda, it brings joy to my heart. To hear that, you must turn to page 16 to hear the rest of my letter. Page 15 contains some artwork. The signpost points to Aragain Falls, the House of Eleron, and foothills of Frobaz. And there is our note in our campfire. Some of these pictures actually contain hints and, uh, you know, things that give you uh, basically tips on where to go next. So it is interest, or it is uh, not only interesting, but um, a good idea to pay attention to the artwork, which is another reason why I thought it was important to, uh, for every uh, game book that I try to record, uh, have the pages and the artwork. I didn't want to really do this without the artwork, especially. Anyways, on to 16. You have returned. Sir Elrond tells me that he met you in the foothills, that you have the Sword of Zork. We must hurry off to battle. The armies of Krill are massing again beyond the dam, and I fear they will attack before nightfall. We will go to Elrond's house as soon as possible. Meet us there with the sword, Sayovar. Will we take the path to the house of Elrond, as Sayovar request? Or will we take the other path to Aragain Falls? Well, I don't know. This is where the adventure splits up. Let me think. One takes us to uh, a forest path, and another takes us into a deep, dark cave, which those are always kind of fun as well. Let's go ahead and let's go to the house of Elrond as Sayovar is requested. Geronda and Bivitar head down the forest trail toward the house of Elrond. The chirping of the songbird comes again, somewhat louder this time. Cheered by the sound and the beauty of these woods, they begin to whistle a cheerful tune, certain that their uncle Sayovar will defeat the armies of Krill and meet them soon. The trail suddenly forks again, this time there is no signpost. One trail is covered with a thick bed of leaves. The other shows the dirt of the forest floor. Next to the fork in the trail stands a large tree. Unlike the other trees in the forest, it saw has some low branches and could be climbed. What do we do now? We should definitely climb the tree, because tree climbing is awesome! And here is some artwork of the forest on our way to the House of Elrond. Not to be confused with the House of Elrond from Lord of the Rings. This was written in eight... Well, this was written after Lord of the Rings by quite a few years, so... Who knows? Maybe some inspiration? Let's climb the tree, Biv, suggests Geronda. Maybe we can get a view of the surrounding area. Good idea, Geron. But you should do it. You've always been a better tree climber than me. Geronda agrees and clambers up into the tree. She climbs as high as she can, but she can't see anything besides a few surrounding trees. However, nestled between two branches is a bird's nest. The view's not any better up from up here, she calls down to Bivitar. But there's a bird's nest. Who cares? Come back down. Wait, I want to look in the nest. She works her way over to the nest and looks inside. There, among the sticks and mud, is a shiny bronze key. She takes the key and climbs back down to the ground. Look what I found in the nest. She shows the key to Bivitar. Well, hang on to it. It might turn out to be useful. But we still don't know which path to take. Well, earlier we learned that taking the leaf-covered path would lead us straight to Krill. We obviously don't want to do that because that will also lead to death and only two points. So let us take the dirt path. Let's take the dirt path, suggests Bivitar. It looks safer, Geronda concurs. They walk along the trail and soon come to a large clearing in the woods. In the center of the clearing is a white house. Its door and windows are all boarded. On a post near the door is a mailbox. Do you think this is Elrond's house? Bivitar asks. Yes. Look at the mailbox. Says Elrond. They walk around the house looking for a way to enter. The doors and windows all seem tightly sealed. 
Then behind the house, Geronda notices that one window is slightly ajar. Vivitar tugs on it with all his strength, and finally it opens just enough for them to enter. They crawl through the window and find themselves in a kitchen. On a table are bottles of water and a large, long sack smelling of hot peppers. Oh, now you have my interest. I don't know about you, but I'm starved, says Geronda in Vivitar's voice. She opens the sack and finds a hot pepper sandwich with a clove of garlic. Yuck! I'd prefer peanut butter and jelly, but I guess it's better than nothing. Sorry, she sounds like an old witch. Uh, she gives half the sandwich to Vivitar. And they share the water. Neither eats the garlic. Well, that really hit the spot, Vivitar says. I hope Sayavar gets here soon. Let's look around the house. The first room they come to is the living room. It is furnished with a heavy wooden trophy case. Inscribed on the case are some ancient runes. They realize with surprise that they can read the runes. Only when the three palantirs of Zork are returned to this case can the evil be driven from the land and the great underground empire rise once more. The trophy case is empty. Sitting on top of it is a battery-powered brass lantern. Huh? A heavy oriental rug covers the floor. We've got to find those spears, spears, and bring them here, says Jorinda. Yeah, but what do we do in the afternoon, Vivitar says laughing. Go ahead and laugh. I'm going to look under this rug for a trapdoor. Vivitar laughs even harder. Sure, sure. Jorinda pulls the old rug to side of the room, revealing a trapdoor. Vivitar's jaw drops open. Gosh, he gasp. How did you know that would be there? I felt a bump under the rug. She examines the door. It's locked, but there's a keyhole. Did you get the bronze key from the bird's nest? If so, go to page 50. If not, go to 53. Well, we did, so we'll go to 50. The key from the bird's nest, Pivotar says. Try the key you found in the tree. Geronda inserts the key in the lock. It opens easily. The trap door is heavy, though, and the two of them pull with great effort until the door swings open, revealing a rickety staircase leading down into the darkness. Awfully dark down there, Geronda says nervously. Maybe this lantern works. Vivitar turns the lantern on and gives off a cheery yellow glow. Let's go down and have a look around. They go down the stairs and find themselves in the cellar of the house. On one side they see the bottom of a metal chute, black with coal dust. It looks very steep and slippery. On the other side a tunnel leads away from the cellar. Strange gurgling noises seem to come up from the darkness beyond the reach of the lamp. This is too spooky, Bev. Let's go back upstairs. As Dranda starts climbing up, the trapdoor crashes shut above her. They seem to hear a deep-throated chuckle. But the sound could just be their imagination or some trick of the underground echoes. A quick check reveals that the trapdoor is locked and that there is no keyhole on this side. I guess we might as well see where this tunnel goes. They follow the tunnel for several minutes. Its walls become rough and uneven. The tunnel turns a corner and opens into a small underground room carved out of rock. At the far end of the room, the tunnel continues. Another passage, dark and sinister, leads off to the left. Out of the shadow leaps a huge and hairy troll. He is brandishing a bloody axe and blocks the far exit of the room. Vivitar sees a blue glow form around the sword of Zork, and he feels a powerful energy from it flowing into his arm. Without even thinking, he strikes a fighting pose and approaches the troll. The troll spits out an angry snarl and raises his axe high above his ugly head. Bev, this way! Dranda points to the low, spooky passage to her left. You'll get, you'll, you'll get killed if you fight the troll! Would you escape down the sinister-looking passage? Like a wimp? Or will we fight the troll like a man? We're gonna fight the troll, of course. Bivitar follows the urging of the sword. The troll rushes at him, axe first. He jumps aside and swings at the troll, missing by an inch. The troll grunts and swings the axe at the Bivitar, who ducks just in time. The axe crashes against the wall, throwing off sparks. The sword grows warm in Bivitar's hand, and with mighty effort, he raises the sword and swings it in a wide arc toward the troll. The troll seems confused and freezes just long enough to doom himself. The sword sinks deep into the troll, who lets out a wail and expires. His body vanishes in a cloud of billowing black smoke. You did it! Shouts Juranda. I thought you were crazy!
It was, it was almost as if the sword made the decision to fight the troll. I know it sounds crazy. He scratches his head. They enter the wide tunnel that exits from the far end of the troll room. It widens and finally opens into a flat ledge overlooking a vast underground lake below. A steep trail leads down to the water's edge. Sprawled at the far end of the ledge is a skeleton of a deceased adventurer. Clutched in his bony hand is what appears to be a parchment scroll. Do we take the parchment? Or do we continue the trail toward the water? Of course we take the parchment, are you kidding me? Gerondo approaches the skeleton and snatches the parchment. As she does, the bones collapse in a pile of dust. Duranda jumps back in surprise. Shaking, she unrolls the parchment. Look! It's a map! She points to an inscription at the bottom of the map. This map shows the final resting place of the three palantirs of Zork. And here we have There Be Trolls and the Maze. Uh, there Be Dragons. Beware, the layers of the Gru are all these little points here marked with little G's. This map actually kind of helps you get through the rest of the game book. Kind of. Let's go to page 62. But it doesn't show the final resting place, says Gerardo. The bottom corner is missing. The volunteers must be somewhere down there. Well, at least it shows the ledge we're on, and see, it indicates that we should go right. The two adventurers go right and find a very narrow path leading alongside of the cliff. Soon they have a view of the entire lake below, ending at a huge dam. Water from the lake pours down over the dam, which appears to be somewhat neglected. They round in a bend in the cliff. Part of the path before them is missing, destroyed after the map was made, possibly by an earthquake. The gap is about 15 feet wide. We can jump across says Bivitar. Are you nuts? asked Juranda. Let's think for a minute. There must be a better way to get across. Should we jump across? Or wait and think? Jumping across will lead to your death in five points. So let's wait and think. I could probably rig up a way to get across if only we had some rope, says Bivitar. Do we have anything to build a hot air balloon from? asked Juranda. Uh... I don't think so, Bivitar answers, looking around. I don't have any other ideas. Suddenly, a gnome appears out of thin air. He's dressed in a loud outfit of bright green and orange. Having some trouble getting across, he asks. They nod grimly. Well, I can get through a cross, but it won't be cheap. What do you want? Bivitar asks. Hmm. How about that nice sword you're carrying? No, cries Jorunda. That belongs to our Uncle Sayavar, yells Bivitar. The gnome visibly impressed, is impressed, but says, Nevertheless, either you give me the thought or you don't get the cross. Saranda whispers to Bivitar, We can't give him the sword. Here is some artwork of the little punk gnome that is trying to take our sword from us. I say, let's go back and try the path toward the lake. I agree, we shouldn't give him the sword, says Bivitar. But hold on a minute. Maybe we can think of some way to trick him. Let's try to trick the gnome and go to page 75. Okay, you greedy gnome. We may have the sword, but only when we're on the other side of the gap. Bivitar looks solemnly at the gnome. Do you agree? Only when we're on the other side of this gap. Fine, fine, the gnome agrees, eagerly rubbing his hands together. Watch this. It's one of my best spells. The gnome begins chanting in some twisted tongue. He waves his arms wildly. His hair flies about his head as if tossed by a fierce wind. Traces of smoke begin to pour from his... from his... ears. Suddenly, a sturdy bridge spans the gap. The gnome slumps against the cliff wall, exhausted. Hurry across, the gnome urges. The bridge will only last for 30 seconds. Bivitar and Jodranda dash across the bridge with the gnome just behind. When they reach the end of the bridge, they stop and face the gnome, who also stops, but on the bridge several feet from the end. The gnome boots at them and tells Bivitar to hand over the sword. Ah, Bivitar explains. We agreed to give you the sword only when we are on the other side of the gap. 
We are now on this side, not the other side. As you can plainly see, there's no one on the other side. What? That's not... What? You... The gnome looks angry and confused. He leans on the railing of the side of the bridge and runs a hand through his stringy hair. Then, coming to a decision, he begins rolling up his sleeves. Well, boy, if you won't give me the sword, as we agreed, I guess I'll just have to take it. Vivitar gulps nervously. The gnome takes a step toward him, and suddenly the bridge vanishes around him. With a look of stunned amazement, he plunges into the abyss, screaming, Valbernoid! Teach him to be so greedy, Vivitar mumbles as they continue down the trail. What does the map show now? The path should be entered in an opening cliff somewhere around here, Duranda tells him. Sure enough, a minute later, they come to an opening in the cliff wall. They follow the path into this cave. The ground drops steeply, and in many places, stairs have been carved in. Carved? Caved in. Carved, no carved in. Turn to page 78. Here is a little bit of artwork depicting the gnome and his impending doom. He was tricked by a couple of kids. Sucks to suck. In many places, stairs have been carved into the rock to make travel easier. After what seems like hours of following this winding passage, they spot a point of light ahead. It grows larger and larger, and soon they emerge from the tunnel, facing a stunning sight. Towering high above them is a tremendous dam. Water from the reservoir above spills over the top of the ancient and neglected dam. Below them, the spill-off forms a mighty river. Downstream, sunlight pours in from a gaping opening where the river flows out of the underground cavern and into the world of the sun. This must be the flood control dam number three, Geranda says, studying the map. It's supposed to be the greatest entering feat in history of the great underground empire, designed by Lord Dimwit Flathead himself. And that's the frigid river, frigid river there. The sounds of hoofbeats are on the night appears, riding toward them along the riverbank. He is bloody and disheveled. He dismounts, looking furious. What in Throb's name are you two doing here? Bivitar and Geranda look at each other. Finally, Bivitar speaks up. We were trying to find the three palanquias and return them in the trophy case in your house. We thought we could help. I'm sorry. Hellron gives a chuckle. Don't be. You both have more courage and cunning than many of my own people to have gotten this far. He looks more serious. But finding the palantirs is impossible. The map that shows how to find them was stolen over a century ago. Is this the map? Durand asks, handing the parchment to Elrond. Elrond looks it over with growing excitement. Great fires of Frobizzle! It's the map, all right. How? When did you... Never mind. This changes everything. Perhaps... Perhaps there's now a chance. He thinks for a moment. Bevatar! Duranda! This is a grave moment. The army of Krill has beaten our knights in battle today. Sayavar has fled to our underground base. Those of us still alive are meeting there to form a last defense against Krill. I was taken prisoner, but I escaped just a few minutes ago. Elrond pauses to arrange his thoughts. I was heading toward the underground base, but this may be more important. If I can get the three spheres to Sayavar before we are completely overwhelmed. Elrond stops as a beautiful gray owl swoops out of the sky and lands on his shoulder. It holds a paper clutched in one claw. Elrond unfolds the paper. It's a message from Sayovar, he explains reading. The knight looks up, his face strained. Sayovar says the Krill warriors are massing for a battle already. If we lose the Krill today, it will be final defeat. I must go there at once. Elrond puts a hand on each of their shoulders. You two have already done a valiant job, but though we may survive Krill's attack today without the power of the three Palantirs, there is no doubt that Krill will soon be victorious. Continue your quest for the legendary spheres. The map will aid you, and the Sword of Zork will protect you. And if you are successful, bring the Palantirs and the Sword to our underground base in the coal mine beyond the dam. Count on us, Elrond, says Duranda. Right, adds Bivitar. But beware, Elrond cautions, pausing for effect. Krill may try to trick you. He may even appear in the form of your uncle, Sayovar. Just remember that Sayovar never removes... Turn page 80-something, I can barely read that. Again, these are all scanned in, so. Sayovar never removes the sapphire ring, the ring of Zork from which his powers flow. 
He mounts his white steed. Good luck, Bivotar and Zoranda. He gallops off. As Elrond vanishes in the distance, Bivotar says, No time to waste. Which way now, Juran? This section of the map is incomplete. Torn away, but I think... She looks around, then points to a zigzagging staircase leading up to the side of the dam. That is the way to the spheres. Did you get the magic sneakers from the Prince of Caldorn? If so, go to page 124. If not, go to page 88. This is actually a pretty funny part of the book. So in this case, we're actually going to pretend and lie and whatever and go to page 124, even though we both know we never got any magic sneakers. There are no magic sneakers and no Prince of Caldorn in this book. You have been cheating. Vindictus, the patron of decision novels, appears. Reaching out of the book, he casts a spell on you. And you turn into an unbelievably ugly toad. The end. Your score is negative 50 million billion zillion points. The score for the best ending probably isn't important to a cheater like you, who probably looks at the last page first. <laughs> All right, so no cheating, folks. No cheating. They slowly climb the Disney stairway at the top of the dam. The stairs end on top, a small building perched on the dam. The view from here is awesome. The river forming below the dam is flowing out of the cavern. The great reservoir lying in a giant underground cavern behind the dam. The dam itself ancient, but still magnificent. They enter the small building through an access hatch in its roof. It turns out to be the control room of the dam. Tremendous pipes crisscross the walls and ceiling. A control panel with four powerful-looking buttons adorns the wall. A large window looks out across the surface of the dam itself, where water from the reservoir calmly glides over the top of the dam, before plunging into the river valley below. The only exit seems to be a ladder leading up to the access hatch in the roof. Let's see what these buttons do, says Bivitar. Are you crazy? We'll probably blow ourselves up. Let's cross the top of the dam. The water doesn't look too deep. It'll be safe. Shall we manipulate the dam controls? Or leave them alone and try to cross the top of the dam? I think we'll play around with the controls a bit. Pivotar, feeling slightly nervous, presses the first button. With a faint crackle, the lights in the control room come on. He's pleased and jabs at the next button. A loud crashing sound conies from the distance of the dam. Jorinda cries, standing at the window and looking out. The floodgates of the dam have opened and torrents of water are pouring through them. After just a few minutes, the level of the reservoir has dropped enough to stop the flow of water across the top of the dam. In the valley below, the influx of water is swelling the frigid river beyond its banks. Great, says Bivitar. Now we can cross the dam in safety. Hating with the success of his first two button pushings, Bivitar eagerly hits the third button. Nothing happens for a moment. Then... With a scream, one of the massive pipes burst open, and rusty brown water begins pouring out. Oops, says Bivitar. Water continues spewing from the broken pipe, and within seconds, the water level is up to their ankles. Here is some of the artwork of uh, Geranda and Bivitar crossing the dam. that is now filling up quite quickly with brown water. We'd better scram, suggests Bivitar. At that moment, another pipe bursts, and a large section of wall collapses. The water swirls around their knees. Quick, Joranna, out the hatch! He starts toward the ladder. Two more pipes burst, and the water level reaches their waist. Look! Look! Joranna cries, pointing to a hollow area behind the collapsed wall, quickly filling with water. There, resting on a rotting beam, are the three palantirs of Zork, glowing with the brilliant light of their own. Immediately, a wash of brown water sweeps over the spheres, and they vanish from sight. The water splashes against their cheeks. Shall we try to save the three spheres, or save our own neck? I think we should probably go for the spheres, folks. Bibotar dives for the submerged palantirs. The water is murky and filled with powerful eddies, but he gropes around and locates the rotting beam with the three spheres. He places the spheres in a leather pouch hanging from his belt. He tries to straighten up, but discovers that his leg is wedged between two of the pipes. He cannot work it free, and the water swirls far above his head. Duranda, meanwhile, is treading water. Its level has neared the ceiling of the control room. She peers into the muddy water, but can see no sign of Bivotal. Beginning to panic, she dives down to look for him, but only succeeds in banging her head on some submerged pipes. 
just as Bivita, Jung's seen lungs. Does that look that looks like Jung's to me, but we'll we'll, we'll assume that's lungs. Just as Bivita's lungs seem ready to burst, another pipe breaks, loosening the one holding his leg. At the same moment, the window of the control room explodes outward from the water pressure. Bivita and Duranda are both swept out of the control room on a wave of muddy water. They land on the surface of the wide dam. I thought you were. Duranda sobs and seems embarrassed to be crying now that the danger is over. I've got them. Bivitar grasps between, gasps between breaths. He points to his bulging pouch. <laughs> After Duranda wipes her eyes and wrings her, out her hair, and Bivitar gulps in lungfuls of fresh air, the two intrepid adventures set out across the dam. The dam's surface is damp and slippery with algae, but eventually they reach the north side, where a path leads upward along a cliff overlooking the reservoir. The cavern ceiling far above glows dimly with the light of phosphorescent mosses. The path soon reaches the entrance to a mine. Huge piles of coal heaped around the entrance. Within, they can see flickering torches lining the walls. They enter warily and almost immediately come to a junction. To their right, the tunnel leads downward into the heart of the mine. To the left is a room which sparkles in torchlight. They gasp at the sight. Treasures and riches of every description are piled up to the ceiling of the room. Gold and silver coins fill chests to overflowing. Wow, says Bivitar, his eyes glowing. What do you think? Explore the fabulous riches of the treasure room? I think not. Obvious trap. Or go directly into the depths of the coal mine. Well, if you do go explore the treasure room, it eventually leads to your death one way or another. But you end up with 8 out of 10 Zork points. Not too bad. However, we will continue to page 103. Keeping their minds on the more important issue of getting the Crystal Palantirs to Sayovar, Jiranda and Bivotar turn their backs on the treasure and descend into the coal mine. The tunnel continues downwards, and the torches appear less frequently. Finally, a voice cries out, Stand and be identified. They stop, and one of the knights steps out of the shadows. Oh, it's you two! Sayuvar will be delighted! Follow me! He turns and leads them back into a large chamber carved out of the balls of a coal mine. Many knights are standing and sitting about, eating and poring over maps of the underground. Other knights are sleeping on cots at the far end of the room. The room is lit by many small torches mounted on the wall, casting an eerie glow over everything. One man, taller and better armed than the rest, turns toward them and exclaims, Yo-ho! A few broad steps bring them to their side, and he embraces them. This day has proved a happy one, after all. Are you well? They both nod. Some food for Tarana and Bivitar, he bellows. One of the knights ladles out two bowls of lukewarm stew and breaks off two generous chunks from a loaf of bread. Another knight pulls up a bare wooden bench for them to sit on. Once they are seated and eating, Sayovar says, Elrond tells me that you have the sword and you have been shaking the three palantirs. How has thy quest gone? After they are seated and eating a hearty stew, Sayavar says, Elrond tells me that you have the sword and have been seeking the three palantirs. How has the quest gone? Okay, so we have an instance of two of the same paragraphs being <laughs> said twice. Probably a typo. That is actually in the book as well, that double paragraph. Here's a picture of Sayovar with his winged helm, his chain mail, and his Hawaiian skirt. Uh, yeah, looks like a Hawaiian straw skirt, pretty much. We've got them, Duranda says, smiling. Oh, excellent. We now have a fighting chance to defeat Krill after all. His face hardens. Well, let's have the spheres and the sword. Time is of essence. He reaches two massive bare hands toward them. Something tugs at the back of Bivitar's mind. Come on, come on, says Sayovar impatiently. Would you give the sword of Zork and the three palantirs to Sayovar? Or, if not, go to page 111. Of course, as we learned earlier and were warned about Krill acting like Sayovar, we will not give him the items. And instead, we'll go to page 111. We don't trust this mofo. No! Shouts Vivitar backing away. Duran, he isn't wearing the wing of Zork. And if you noticed in the picture before, he was indeed not wearing any ring. 
That's not Sayovar. It's an imposter. Sayovar curses and spits and then vanishes to be replaced by an ugly creature robed in, robed in black and radiating evil. The knights have vanished as well, and in their place stands armed lizards, saliva dribbling down their massive jaws. Run! Pivotal cries to Dranda. Run! He dashes back into the passages of the coal mine, Dranda right on his heels. Behind them, a hissing voice bellows, Capture them! They run as fast as they can through the dim and unfamiliar passages. The ground climbs steeply, and their hearts pound from fear and exertion. Close behind their pursuers pound along, their armor clattering. Pivotal stumbles and Dranda helps him up. The warriors of Krill nearly close the gap between them. The passages twist and turn, and it is impossible to tell how far they are from the entrance to the mine. Their lungs feel about to burst, but the lizard fighters are still gaining ground. Here's some sweet artwork of who we assume to be Krill. This is probably what happens if you give him the sword in the Palantirs. However, we have not. We're being chased by what looks like gigantic iguanas. And here is a said picture of said gigantic iguanas. Vivitar feels a spear graze his leg, and he begins to lose hope. Around a bend, a large bend of coal sits next to the top of a metal ramp that slopes away into the ground. Follow me! Hence Jaranda. Hurtling through the mouth of the metal ramp, Vivitar follows one step ahead of his pursuers. The ramp is slippery, and the two adventurers slide down at a wild pace. The ramp is also full of sudden twists and turns, making it hard for them to catch their breath. Then, as suddenly as their ride began, it is over and they land at the bottom in a pile of coal dust. When their heads are clear, they realize that they are in the cellar of a house. Rickety stairs lead up to a trap door which opens. Voices can be heard from the room above. Shall we go upstairs or wait here? I think waiting is for pansies. Let's go upstairs. They climb the rickety stairs and find themselves in the living room of Elrond's house. Elrond is there as a number of other knights, and someone who looks exactly like the form that Krill took in the coal mine. Biv and Juran, he greets them warmly, the caring smile on his face, the kindness in his eyes, and the gentle warmth of his hands on their shoulders. Leave little doubt that this is truly Sayovar. They do not even need to check the ancient ring that Sayovar wears. We have the Sword of Zork, says Bivotar, handing it to Sayovar. And we found the three palantirs, adds Juranda pointing to the bulging pouch. A look of relief passes across Sayovar's face. Elrond told me of your quest, but when Krill discovered our hideout in the coal mine and we were forced to flee here, I feared the worst. Now there isn't a moment to lose! As if to prove Sayovar's last statement, one of the knights peering through the cracks of the boarded up windows cries, Krill's army is surrounding the house! They're easily 10,000 strong! And here's some artwork of the army that's approaching. This is also where it becomes very linear. Quickly, Sarovar removes the crystal palantirs from the leather pouch. They shine with an inner light of their own. The first one fiery red, the second glowing blue like a perfect summer sky, and the third one is a shimmering white. He places the spheres in the trophy case, mummering. He drops to one knee, leaning on the hilt of the sword, and recites a spell in an unknown tongue. An arc of light leaps between the three spheres and grows to encompass the entire room. It flashes blindly bright, and as the light fades, so do their surroundings. The house is gone, and instead they stand on a hill in the center of a vast plain. Before them, like a foul black sea, stand the armies, Krill. Krill himself towers above them, larger than life horrible dark cloud before the sun. Behind them, stretching to the horizon, summoned by the power of the Palantir stand, the legendary warriors of Zork, clothed in white tunics and shiny battle armor. Warriors of Zork! cries Sayovar, now mounted on a mighty steed, his voice carrying with unimaginable power. I call upon you to rid our kingdom of this scourge. I summon you to remove this blight. His voice rises to a crescendo. I order you to destroy this evil. With the cheer that echoes across the plain, the warriors charge forward, engulfing the armies of Krill. As the battle rages about them, Sayovar holds the Sword of Zork overhead, its brilliant glow like a beacon to his troops. 
Dark storm clouds form and lightning streaks down into the heart of the battle. Giant balls of fire plunge overhead and explode into a million tiny infernos. A fierce wind whips across the plain, toppling trees and sweeping horses off their feet. After an eternity of chaos, it becomes clear that the armies of Krill are losing both ground and strength. The warriors of Zork press on, seemingly tireless and invincible. With an explosion like thunder, Krill appears standing before Sayavar, his sword drawn. A little glimpse of Krill, who's pretty much twice the size of Sayavar. Dismount and face my challenge, Krill Bellow. Sayovar, nodding grimly, leaps from his steed. Steel meets steel, and as the full battle rages about them, Sayovar at first seems to be better than the better swordsman. But Krill uses a variety of tricks and pyrotechnics to distract his opponent. Krill lunges and seeks his blade deep in the Sayovar's side. The warrior wizard drops to his knees, clutching at the bleeding wound. Krill raises his sword for a final blow. Bivitar and Juranda gasp, powerless to help. With a crack of energy, a blue surrounds the sword of Zork and Sayovar's right arm. With surprising strength, Sayovar raises the sword and meets Krill's attack. Krill falls back, stunned, and Sayovar plunges his blade deep into Krill's heart. Krill clutches at the blade and starts to whisper a powerful curse, but it is too late. He dies. His body disappears into a giant puff of unwholesome smoke. A deathly silence falls. Suddenly, Bivitar, Jaranda, Sayovar, and the knights are back in the living room of the house. Sayovar lies beside his sword, and Elrond rushes over to attend his wound. The other knights watch with concern, until Elrond announces that the wound is not serious. Bivitar and Jaranda notice that the Crystal Palantirs are now black, smoking piles of ash. Sayovar sees their looks. They have served their purpose and exist no more, he tells them. They have too much power for one mortal to control. Now that the evil has been vanquished, they are best left for the gods. He summons them to his side. You have done a great service to me and to everyone in the land. No one can thank you enough. His eyes twinkle knowingly. I understand you have other places you must be and people you must see. Until this moment, they had forgotten their own lives, but now they realize how terribly they want to go home. Take this ring. Sayovar says, removing the ring of Zork from his finger. When you wish to return, and I hope it will not be too long, just place this ring on your finger. He hugs them affectionately, and then encants a brief spell. A puff of grey smoke surrounds them. They wake, as if from a deep sleep, to find themselves lying in a thicket near the schoolyard, wearing their regular clothes. They stare at each other in silence. Did it really happen, or was it just a dream? June finally asks. Bill laughs. <laughs> I've been trying to get up the nerve to ask you the same question, but I was afraid you'd think I was nuts. I guess we dreamt it all. Suddenly his hand closes on something in his pocket and he pulls out the Ring of Zork. The light seems to twinkle and dance over its surface. So it wasn't a dream, whispers Bill. June points at the school clock tower. It reads five o'clock. The sun is brushing the treetops in the west. Bivitar, look. We're even back in time for dinner. She adds, lowering her voice a little. I guess it spills again. It's Bill now. But it'll be Bivitar again someday. He smiles at the memory of adventures past and adventures to come. And Jorinda, adds June, smiling along with him. They walk slowly home in silence, happily thinking of the many exciting adventures that await them in the land of Zork. The end. Your score is ten points out of a possible ten points. Congratulations! You would make a fine adventurer. Bivitar and Jorunda survey where your adventures begin. If you've been brave and clever and lucky enough to get this far in the book, you may be ready for Zork computer games from Infocom. You'll find more excitement behind the magic door to Zork than you'll ever find in any arcade. Infocom makes three Zork games in all, as well as thrilling mysteries like Deadline and The Witness and science fiction games like Starcross. Suspended in Planetfall. You can get Infocom games at just about any computer store. We make them for all kinds of computers. Apple II, Atari, Commodore 64, all kinds of other things. Be sure to buy the specially marked Infocom game that's right for your computer and happy adventuring. All right, folks. Well, I hope you enjoyed this first in the series of game books with the game hoarder. 
Zork, the forces of Quill is now complete, and we will be moving on to book two. Soon to come. Thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoyed it. Here is basically uh, the map, if you will, that I created. I just draw it out on construction paper with my sloppy handwriting. Uh, and you can see where the arrows point to the different pages you take. The big X's mean that you die with little parentheses showing how many points you would score. Uh, little pictures like the hot pepper sandwich around page 33, the map that you find around page 61. Uh, and all of it leads to uh, the end on page 126. So I just thought I'd share this with you. Uh, and I will be... I pretty much create these for all the game books once I'm once I'm through with them. I go back through them and create a the best route or uh, I look for the best route um, or the most uh, creative route for what I want to record and put up on YouTube. So I thought this would be cool to share. I hope you guys enjoy it and I hope you enjoy the first of the series. If we get a good reaction from this, there will be more. Thanks for watching.